Today on Destined to Win. I am of the persuasion that the greatest of all gifts other than Jesus, who you could say is one and the same with grace because he is grace personified, that grace is the greatest gift that God could give to you and me. Give me a little grace on my ministry. Give me a little grace in my marriage. Give me a little grace on my job. Give me a little grace in living life. Give me some favor and watch how life changes. God says you're destined to win. We gotta turn it around. Now, one of the ways that we win in life is through change. Right? You can't win unless you change. Matter of fact, to get what you do not have, you've got to start doing what you've never done. If you don't make a change in what you're doing, you're going to get the same results over and over again, right? The definition of insanity, very popular definition, continuing to do the same thing and expecting to get different results. Do you know why marriages fail? Just keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again that have got you into the mess instead of making a change to do new things that will get you out of the mess. And it's the same thing with that in every aspect of life. In order to get different results, we've got to change. If you want abs, you cannot keep eating donuts. A donut for breakfast every day will not give you abs no matter how bad you want it. you got to make a change. A better marriage is only possible if you stop cutting off communication. If you want friends, what do you have to do? You have to show yourself to be friendly, right? It always amazes me at all the people who never say hello to nobody and, you know, don't want to engage in anything. Come to church, listen to the message, sit down and then leave without saying hello. They're like, I don't have any friends. I don't feel like I'm connected around here. Well, say hello to a few people. Shake a few hands. Get involved in a small group. Watch how quick you get some friends in your life. If you want different results, you got to do different things. If you want to get better at something, you got to keep learning and practicing. You don't just get better by accident. If you want more likes on Facebook, what do you have to do? You have to like other people's page, otherwise it's not going to happen. And so if we want better lives, we've got to make some changes. If we want to win in life, we've got to change and do what we've never done before. If we're going to change, we've got to face the truth about change. Change is, is, is a rough commodity, if you will. So I want to share a couple of truths about change with you. Number one, we often resist change. Change is probably one of the most um, seriously resisted things in our entire lives. And you remember the story in Luke chapter 18 about the rich young ruler? I mean, here's this guy, and, and his profile says that he's got it all. He's rich, he's young, he's got power, he's educated, he's got a bright future, he's moral. You know, a lot of people, when they think of the rich young ruler, right, they think this guy got his wealth by, you know, cutting corners and being shady. But if you read his discussion with Jesus, he seems pretty moral. He obeys his mother and father. He honors them. He, he, you know, he's got all the commandments or a lot of the commandments down except for maybe one or two. So he's, he's a pretty moral guy. He's a good guy. He's got a bright future. But maybe it was the turn of a new year for him. Maybe he's thinking, I want something different this year. It's something that money and power and prestige can't buy me. I want a sense of fulfillment on the inside. And so he goes to Jesus, the fountain of wisdom. He's got a one-on-one -on -one audience with Jesus. And he says this to Jesus. He goes, good master, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? He's got an audience with the one who has the answer to all things. He asks him the question, and Jesus famously gives the answer. What does he say? He says, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And all of the prosperity haters, this is their favorite verse in the Bible right here. This is their favorite one. By the way, you know what I've noticed about people who are against money? None of them ever turn down raises. Have you ever noticed that about people who are against money? I'm thinking like, you know, just be poor then. You know what? Why do you have have a roof over your head if you think that poverty is such a blessing in your life. Just live in a cardboard box on the street and you've got it made. You're, you're living the life then, you know. But anyway, I, I digress. The fact of the matter is Jesus speaks to this guy and he gives him the answer to what he wants. 
He basically says, listen, and, 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 and without getting into the nitty-gritty, the theology behind what he said, he basically says this, if you want something different, if you want what you don't have, you've got to do something that you've never done before. You've got to make a significant change. And you remember the end of the story, the Bible says he goes away sad because he had great possessions. Literally, the possessions had him. Literally, the possessions were first in his life. God wasn't first in his life. And so he wasn't willing to make the change. He resisted the change, and we resist change for all sorts of reasons. We resist change, number one, because we are stubborn. We're like that, that two-year-old that's, that's got the thing in their hand that they're about ready to put in their mouth, and the parent knows they've got to get it out of their two-year-old's hands because the two-year-old is going to choke on it, and you go over to get it. And, and the kid usually doesn't just go, here. Right? The kid usually just grabs it and holds on to it. And you got to kind of pry it out of their hand. And that's what God has to sometimes do to us, right? Because we have stuff in our lives that we're holding on to that's going to make us choke. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 32, verse 9, the Bible says, Don't be ornery like a horse or a mule that needs bit and bridle to stay on track. You remember the, the famous sermon that I preached last year? How many remember that sermon from this verse? It was called, Don't Be an Ass, right? Because what do asses do? Asses are stubborn, right? They dig their heels in. They, they don't want to change. And, and, and that's what happens with us. And so we resist change because we're stubborn. Number two, we resist change because we feel trapped a lot of times. We're like the monkey and the coconut. You ever hear about monkeys and coconuts? You know, you drill a hole in a coconut, put a rock on the inside, the monkey comes over, finds the coconut with the rock on the inside, jiggles it around, realizes there's a rock on the inside, really wants the rock on the inside, so squeezes his hand through the hole, grabs hold of the rock, and then tries to pull the rock out with his hand. But the hole is not big enough for him to get his hand and the rock out. The only way he can get his hand back out is if he drops the rock. But he loves the rock so much that he refuses to drop the rock, and along comes the people who are trying to capture him. Him and he's trapped by his own unwillingness to let go of the rock. We love our rocks, don't we? I mean, we just hold on to them and God comes along. He's like, listen, you need to drop that rock. You need to get rid of that rock. You, need, you know, you need to just let go. You need a change in your life. And because we trap ourselves, we don't change. And then number three, we don't change because we're comfortable. Do you know that there are still people in this church with flip phones? And if they don't have flip phones, they have slide phones, you know. They, they've upgraded from the flip to the slide, you know, type of thing. And there are others who have rotary phones still in their house. Not because of nostalgia, not because they think, man, this looks nice. And, and you know, just, and they also have dial-up modems in their house. Can you believe that? And, and, and they use these things not because they don't recognize that the other stuff is more advanced, but they, they're comfortable and what they know about that stuff. And they are unwilling to break out of their comfort zone and learn something else. And I just want to encourage you that if you feel like that, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. He can get you from a flip phone to a smartphone. If Jesus died on a cross for you, he can teach you how to use a smartphone. In any case, we feel comfortable, right? And so we don't change. And then we don't change because sometimes we're afraid. People who have those flip phones, a lot of times they're just afraid. Well, I don't think I'll be able to use it. And so they stay stuck because they're afraid. And then the last reason why we don't change is because there's a price to change. The, the old saying, no pain, no gain, is so true. Change is not easy. Change doesn't come natural. Change requires that you pay a price up front for a long-term promise. I mean, when you put it in that perspective, right, it almost seems like, yeah. I mean, if I told you right now that you needed to give me a hundred bucks and I'd give you back a thousand in a week from now, how many of you would sign up to give me the hundred bucks right now, right? Fact of the matter is that that temporary pain up front, right, and, and, and a future promise for a longer period of time is worth it, but we don't want to pay the price up front, and so we resist change, and we can't resist it if we want to have a better life. Second thing about change that you need to know is not all change is created equal. Some changes are voluntary and some changes you get no vote on. So, some changes are good changes and some changes are bad changes, right? 
Sometimes you have good change and bad change happening at the same time, right? Your family's on its way up. Your finances are on its way down. Your, 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 your family's on its way down. Your finances are on its way up. Sometimes there's an overlap between good change and bad change in our life. And then there are, the, the, are those bad changes that start off bad but turn out really, really good. And as I was putting this together, here's what I heard God say. This is God's word for somebody right here. Bad changes. They start off bad, but they turn out really, really good. You remember Joseph in the Bible? Joseph in the Bible, I mean, he is the apple of his parents' eye, right? He's got everything going on. He's the one with the big dreams and the big aspiration. He's the favorite child. At Christmas time, he gets the good Christmas present, the Versace robe. And his brothers and sisters, they get socks and underwear, and they hate him for it, right? They're like, well, why'd you get him a good gift? And why do we get this? And so he kind of, you know, flaunts it a little bit and enjoys the fact that he's the favorite child. And one day, his brothers get, get fed up with him, and they beat him up, give him a wedgie, and throw him into a pit. You remember that, right? That's, that's basically the story of Joseph. And he gets a bad change, and then he goes from the pit, and he winds up in slavery, and then in prison. How many of you know that that's bad changes in life? I mean, those aren't good things. He got no vote on those things. He didn't choose those particular things. But I love what Joseph said at the end of the story. How many of you know there is more of the story yet to be lived and yet to be told and yet to be written? And what happens with us so often is we push the pause button on the story before the story is over because we lose track and we lose sight of the fact that God is the author and the finisher of our faith. He who has started the story has committed to bringing the story to its rightful conclusion. And the rightful conclusion for the children of God is we win. That's, this, that's the way it works when you're a child of God. And so Joseph is now facing his brothers. And of course, he's now prime minister, right? He got called from prison to the palace. And he was promoted to be prime minister. And he looks at them and he says, as for you, you meant evil against me. Bad change, right? But God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. That's a bad change that turned out real good. And that's somebody's word for 2016 right there, that you might be in something that is a bad change right now. Something that, you know, you didn't get a vote on, something that you didn't ask for, something that just came upon you in life. But if you'll stay faithful to God, if you'll just, just stay committed to God, if you'll stay on, on God's side, God will see to it that he changes that bad change into a good change that is worth it all. And so just stay faithful. Just this week, I talked to, a, to an old friend who lost his wife. She was only in her 40s. And he's got two kids that he's left to be a single dad with, an 8-year-old and a 10-year-old. And he's having to process through that hard change that he didn't get a vote on. But here's the thing. He can still win. And, and here's the thing that we all, all have to realize. We can win no matter what the kind of situation that comes against us is. And so I asked him, well, how do you deal with the hard change? How do you win over hard changes like that? And I thought about the Apostle Paul. And he could relate to going from a fairly easy life to a real hard life. And here's the thing. His life was easier when he wasn't serving God. That, that'll blow some people's theology out of the water, right? Because we think, you know, when, it, when we serve God, our life gets easier. I believe our life gets better, but I don't necessarily believe it gets easier, right? Easy by the way that we define easy. Easy in terms of we no longer rely on our own strength and our own ability and our own power, but there's a power outside of ourselves and inside of ourselves that gives us the motivation and the strength to keep going in life. And so from that sense, it's easier, but sometimes more stuff can go on in your life. And here's the thing. The way that you get to deal with it is limited when you're a Christian. Right? When you're not a Christian, you, you can deal with it any way you want to. You know, you can get even and you can get back and you can lash out and, and, you, can, and you can do all those. But when you're a Christian, you have to go with vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and I will repay. How hard is that? Right? I mean, has anybody else wanted to take vengeance into their hand ever since you've been saved? Right? Come on. Someone would be like, I'm just not raising my hand. Just, it's okay. We all feel that way. 
2 Corinthians 12, 7, the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee of all Pharisees. He was a, a leading member of the Sanhedrin. He was the one who had power and prestige and riches. And he was uh, inflicting the pain on people. And all of a sudden, he gives his life to Christ on the road to Damascus. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, he says this. He says, unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations that were given me. Now, some versions in your, in your Bibles might say, unless I should become conceited. It is a horrible translation. The Apostle Paul never had an issue with being conceited. If you read the prior chapter, he tells you over and over again about how he can only glory in the things of God. And so that's a poor translation. What it literally means is, to prevent me from living above my circumstances... Through the revelation that was given me. How many of you know when you have revelation, you can live above your situation? For instance, let me give you a revelation that will help you to live above your situation. If you know that joy comes in the morning... If you've got a revelation of that, if you understand that your situation now is not what it's always going to be because there is a God behind your situation who is working it out for your good, then you can live above your situation and have joy even when you ought to have dread in your life, right? That's a revelation that causes you to live above your circumstances. And so the Apostle Paul said, I got all these revelations, you know, Jesus taught him personally in the wilderness of Arabia for three and a half years. I've got all this revelation, and I can live above my circumstances. But to prevent that from happening, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Now, there are so many smart but ignorant theologians out there that write books about Paul's thorn in the flesh. And they suppose what it was. And they say, well, Paul was sick and Paul was blind and Paul had this going on and that going on. But what I just want to ask them is, do they know how to read? Because the very next portion of the same sentence says, was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan to buffet me. So the question is, what was Paul's thorn in the flesh? It was a messenger from Satan to buffet me. What's a messenger from Satan? A sent one. The apostle Paul was so dangerous to the kingdom of darkness that the enemy of our soul, the devil, sent a demonic presence to the apostle Paul so that everywhere he went, he would have hardship in his life. It was a bad change, a hard change that the apostle Paul had to learn to deal with. How do I learn to, to live with the fact that everywhere I try to do something for God, something is going to come against me. Something is going to try to prevent me. And he went to God and he asked God three times. He said, God, can you take this messenger from Satan away from me? And most people think well, thinks that God said, well, no, I can't do nothing about that. Sorry, just live with it. By the way, the word no is never in the text that we're reading right now. God never says, nope, sorry, I can't answer that prayer. Here's what God says. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, here, here's when revelation matters. Because if you don't know what grace is, you're like, well, who cares? But you're still not doing nothing about the devil, God. What do you mean, my grace is sufficient? I am of the persuasion that the greatest of all gifts other than Jesus, who you could say is one and the same with grace because he is grace personified. That grace is the greatest gift that God could give to you and me. Give me a little grace on my ministry. Give me a little grace in my marriage. Give me a little grace on my job. Give me a little grace in living life. Give me some favor and watch how life changes. Here's what he was saying. Paul, he may be buffeting you everywhere you go, but if you'll just tap into my grace, if you'll just begin to operate, and if you look at the Apostle Paul, he is a big-time grace preacher, isn't he? I mean, he preaches so hard about grace that he was preaching hard about grace one time that he said, I know what some of you are thinking right now. You're thinking if there's that much grace, can't we just go on sinning, Right? Why did they think that? Because he was like, grace, grace. God loves you no matter what, grace. And it's not, it's not by, by works that you're saved, but by grace. And, you know, even if you do all these things, even though you shouldn't do all these things, that God still loves you and he still secured you. And you're still going to heaven. And they're like, whoa, man, this, this is heavy, this grace stuff. Can we still sin? And it's like, God forbid, you're missing the point. But he got a revelation of grace. 
And that grace caused him to live above his situation. How do you live above the hard things in life that you don't get a vote on? It's called grace. It's called that empowerment that comes into your life when you're too weak. It's that empowerment that carries you. It's that empowerment that helps you. It's that empowerment that lifts you. It's that empowerment that uses you. It's that empowerment that helps you to keep on going when you don't feel like you can go anymore. And it's that empowerment that comes into your life when you are at your weakest points. When we are weak, he is strong. How do you deal with the hard things? Grace. You rely on God's grace. So grace is so important in order for us to deal with the changes in life that are not all equal. There are different kinds of changes. The third thing I want to tell you about change that, that's so important is our view of change, <coughs> excuse me, and God's view of change often differ. Most of us want our situation and our circumstance to change. Isn't that what we want, right? And the reason why we want our situation and our circumstances to change is because we think that will produce a better life for us, right? Because for us, it's, can we just be honest and real? Can we just tap into our human side for a minute? Most of us exist so that we can have a better life. I'm not saying that's right. Right? But I'm just talking about reality. The, the reason why most people go to work is so that they can have a better life. The reason why most people are interested in anything is what can I get out of the deal? It's converse to the way that God wants us to live, but it's the reality of a human existence, right? We think that if circumstances change and situations change, then we will have a better life. And so we want to change more what's happening on the outside then we are really interested in what's happening on the inside. And so when people ask things like, if you could change anything about your life, what would it be? And then people will say, well, I'd like to be skinnier. Well, I'd like to be taller. I'd like to be better looking. I'd like blue eyes instead of brown eyes. And I, I'd like to have a little bit more hair. And, and, and I'd like to change my bulges, of course, unless you're John Legend who likes all that stuff anyway. And, and so the flip phone people are going, what did he just say? I don't understand. In any case, right, we, we want the superficial Changes. Changes on the outside rather than changes on the inside. But here's what I've learned about God. God wants to change our circumstances. God wants to change our situation. But God is much more interested in changing our character than he is our circumstances. He's much more interested in changing our inner selves than he is changing our situations. God is much more interested in inside change. And that's why God often uses the circumstances that we want to see him change to change us. Have you ever noticed that about God? Here's the reason why. Because circumstances and situations will come and go. God changes the circumstance, but if God doesn't change the character, guess what, guess what happens? You're back in the same circumstance later on. But if God uses the circumstance and the situation to change your character, the next time you face the circumstance and the situation, you choose not to get back into it because you have an inside change, something on the inside that's working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. You're watching an excerpt from Pastor Frank's message, Your Wings Are On The Way. For your gift of any amount, you can receive this complete message. Just call 888-700-5262 and request your copy today. I trust you've been encouraged to begin to make some changes in your life with God's help. His goal is always to conform us more and more into the image of Christ. So say goodbye to the same old, same old and get ready to walk in your destiny. Do you know what else can change your life like nothing else? It's making Jesus Christ your personal Savior. And if you've never asked for forgiveness of sins and invited Christ to come into your life, then pray this prayer with me right now. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, and I invite the Holy Spirit to come and live on the inside of me. I confess Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, and I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, and meant it, I want you to know that Jesus Christ himself has come into your heart. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. 
So let go of the past and begin to walk in your new identity. And if you let us know that you made Jesus Christ your personal Savior, I'll send you out a booklet to let you know how to get started in your journey of faith. Let us know what God is doing in your life through this ministry. We love to hear from people. And thanks again for watching. And always remember that with Jesus, you are destined to win. Have you become set in your ways, content to experience life as the same old, same old, same bad habits, same negative thoughts, giving up on your dreams? Who shall deliver me from this body of sin? He says, but I thank Jesus Christ that he has, right? It's only through Christ. See, God is the one that is in the transformational business. Sometimes I think that we just have to grab hold of a little bit more of what grace is all about. Grace is not just about the saving process, but grace is also about the transforming process. We are not in this thing by ourselves. Take courage and say goodbye to the status quo and begin to embrace the change that God wants to work in your life in the three-part audio series, Change, by Pastor Frank Santora. At the special price of $15, you will receive all three audio messages by calling 888-700-5262 or visit us online at franksantora.cc to order this or many other resources to strengthen your Christian walk. Be sure to make a positive step in the right direction and embrace transformational change so you can begin to win in life today. Faith Worship is excited to announce the release of our brand new worship album, The Offering. It's designed to bring you into God's presence and celebrate His goodness. On the cross where you bled and died Call 1-888-700-5262 to order your copy of this inspired CD album for just $12.99 plus shipping. Many of the lyrics were written by Pastor Frank to encourage you in your Christian walk. The offering is also available right now on iTunes or Google Play. If you're in the New York City or Connecticut area, we invite you to visit us at one of our locations or join us online every Sunday at faithchurch.cc slash live. On behalf of Pastor Frank and from all of us at Faith Church, we love you and we'll see you next week.